Great. Okay, welcome everyone to this information session about the Fellows Program for the Miller Institute for Basic Research in Science. I am Marla Feller. I'm a professor. I'm in the Molecular and Cell Biology Department, and I do research in neurobiology. And I am the executive director right now of the Miller Institute, and I am going to be the one sort of uh, running this information session. But I thought we'd start by introducing some of the other members of the Miller community who are here. So Hillary, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Nice to see so many faces. My name is Hillary Jacobson. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Miller Institute. So I am your main contact. If you have questions about the fellowship or about the process, feel free to email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Brenda? Great. Hello, everybody, and um, welcome. We're so glad you can be here virtually. Um, I'm Vrinda Kanna. I am the Finance and Operations Administrator uh, at the Miller Institute. Okay, Chrissy? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chrissy. Uh, I'm the sort of external consultant that's been working with the Miller Institute for a while on uh, their equity, inclusion, and diversity efforts. I'm super glad to be here uh, and to welcome you all. Excellent. Veronica? Hi, my name is Veronica Sunka. I'm a third year Miller Fellow uh, working in the field of experimental condensed matter physics. And yeah, it's great to tell you today about the fellowship. Okay, and Michael. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Kim. I am also a third year fellow. I work in theoretical computer science and we'll do a more serious intro in a little bit. Yes, mm -hmm. excellent. Okay. So, you know, what are the ground rules here? I will talk, but am happy to be interrupted by questions um, that you have along the way. It's a very short presentation where I'm just going to overview the program. And then I'm and then um, Michael and Veronica are going to sort of talk to you about their experiences in applying for the Miller. And our goal here is for really for people to understand what the program is and what the requirements are for applying and to really answer any questions you might have about the program. So we are the Miller Institute for Basic Research. We're located at the University of California at Berkeley. Let's see. Um, so this institute was started um, in 1943 by a donation by Adolf Miller and Mary Sprague Miller. And their goal was to establish an institute quoted here to de dedicated to the encouragement of creative thought and conduct of research and investigation in the field of pure science. So this money that they donated um, was used to establish a fellows program. And the idea was to use it for promising young scientists and to give them at a very early stage of their career some independence to conduct their research. Um, the program has been expanded uh, to also support visiting uh, faculty members from off campus. It's also kind of an internal sabbatical program for UC Berkeley faculty. We're not going to talk about those faculty programs here. We're going to spend the whole time talking about the about the fellows program. So, uh, so um, the Miller community at any given time is is made up of all of these groups. So there's 25 to 30 fellows um, uh, at any given time. We usually have around 10 visiting faculty. Um, there will be five UC Berkeley faculty who are part of the community. There is an executive committee. I'm the current uh, um, head of that, director of that right now, but that's made up of four Berkeley faculty. And then we have four staff members, um, two of whom are here. And, uh, and then we have an external advisory board. So at any one time, that's the, the community. And we have many events where all members of the community participate. You're gonna see a lot of pictures of happy people at these events throughout the <laughs> presentation. Okay, um, so this, but the Miller community, I think is really important to know that it's got a huge alumni component to it. So there are 500 plus 
former Miller fellows out there. I just want to say I was just at a conference in Japan where uh, uh, I'm a, uh, someone came up to me and said that they had been a Miller fellow in 1983, right? And it was a um, it was amazing to meet someone from them. I myself was a Miller fellow in the 1990s, um, and there and there's just many sort of former Miller fellows out there. There are 400 former visiting professors, 250 former Berkeley faculty who have who have been uh, Miller professors, um, and we we're very good at keeping this alumni group together. Um, and one of the ways that we do this is by having a newsletter that goes out to everyone in this community and uh, continues to sort of keep this community alive. So being part of the Miller group really sort of makes you part of this, this kind of vast network of scientists. Okay, so now let's focus on the Miller uh, Fellows program. So what is the program? So the program is the three-year postdoctoral fellowship and the idea is that you come to UC Berkeley to pursue your postdoctoral studies. It offers full salary support and benefits for three years. So um, right now that's $68,000 a year of salary plus benefits and the benefits include um, health benefits and uh, other benefits that I, I can't remember. You also get a research uh, fund um, of $10,000 that you can spend on your research. You can use it for travel, you can use it for equipment. Um, and the program is really dedicated to early postdocs only. So most uh, people in the program come straight from their PhDs. Um, you don't have to come straight from your PhD, not all people do, but you can only, you have to have less than two years of prior postdoc experience. Um, and then the topics are all areas of basic science research. So there's kind of what I would call the classics, there's astronomy, biology, chemistry, physics, um, earth and planetary science, and then and math, um, and then there's kind of newer areas like statistics and some of the areas of engineering that get classified as basic research. And that's one of the things we can talk about are sort of what areas of research constitute the, the uh, match what we're trying to bring in to the program. So that, that's what the, the program is. Um, so to be clear about this, the Miller Institute itself is kind of your administrative home. It gives you your salary and and, um, and we have events associated with, the, with the, the program, but the fellow, the individual fellows, the postdocs are hosted by an academic department working with a faculty member in one of those departments. So the research is carried out in the facility. So you can, and you'll hear um, from our current Miller fellows sort of what that configuration means to them. So they're, they're carrying out their research in, in one of their home departments provided by, you know, I'm sorry, their host department. Um, but then you participate in events that are associated with the Miller Institute. So I hope that that was um, uh, clear. Uh, yes, we can, we can post the slides. I saw that in the chat. Um, Okay, so who's qualified to be a Miller Fellow? So as I said, you have to have less than two years postdoc experience. Um, you cannot currently have a position at UC Berkeley. So you can't have come to start a postdoc here and say, oh, now I wanna apply for, apply for the Miller program. The idea is you would come to Berkeley with, the, with um, a Miller Fellows position. You cannot have been an assistant professor and then sort of wanna go back and become a postdoc. Um, uh, and yes, someone asked, yes, UC Berkeley students can certainly apply for the program, um, but you can't be a postdoc. You can't be a current postdoc at Berkeley. But if you got your PhD at Berkeley, you can still apply to the program. Um, and we have many, uh, oh, really? Oh, so there you go. Okay, Hillary, maybe you can explain what the, that you can't be a PhD student from Berkeley and apply for the program? If you already received your PhD and now you've left campus and you're no longer on campus, then you could, but you cannot have any sort of position, student or otherwise on campus in order to be eligible. There you go, she would know. So perfect, thank you very much, Hillary, for explaining that, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have many um, Miller Fellows that come from abroad, and so you have to have eligibility, um, if you're a non-US citizen, you have to have an eligibility for a J-1 visa or an F-1 opt visa. Okay, and we have a new program that there's one uh, that's um, called the, the Catherine A. Day Miller Postdoctoral Fellowship Award. So um, the idea is to have one fellow um, a year who has demonstrated some efforts towards community building, 
and outreach um, in support of science. Um, and this is a program that was established in 2020, um, and it's named in honor of Kathy Day, who actually uh, um, retired um, in, I guess, 2019. 2018. Um, and we have our first Kathy Day Fellow who's going to be appointed in 2022. And so, um, that, so that's a particular a new um, uh, one of our postdoctoral, one of the Miller postdoctoral fellows will be named, the, um, will have this position. Okay, so that's the overview um, of the programs. Uh, so now I wanted to go overview the, um, the application process. So um, the so it starts with an, a nomination, and I'll explain in a minute what the nomination process is, and that's due September 12th. Um, then there's an, a full application that's due October 7th. Um, we start we try to make most of our decisions by the end of the year, um, and uh, and so the offers go out between late December and uh, mid February, um, and then you start in uh, August 2023. Um, and the positions would end three years later, July 31st, 2026. And there's not a lot of flexibility around those. There's no flexibility uh, on the deadlines for the nomination and the application. And there's not a, there's very little flexibility about the timing of the position. Um, currently, we do not have an interview process as part of this fellowship. So it's all done via the application. Okay, so so one thing that is different about our um, uh, program is this nomination process. So the first thing that has to happen is that if you're interested in the program is you have to be nominated. So so it's not a self nomination. Someone has to nominate you. So who can nominate you? So they could be a, um, a current department chair or your current faculty advisor. And the idea is that they can attest to your scientific potential you know, um, uh, you know, and, and your ability to sort of carry out, uh, you know, your research. Um, um, nominations are accepted from individuals at any institution around the world. They're not, you don't have to be nominated by someone at UC Berkeley or anyone within UC. So anyone can nominate you. It's usually whoever your thesis advisor is, or it could be a chair of the, of your department, of your current department. Um, the fellows are going to be assessed um, holistically, and it's going to be based on their application materials and are selected based on their promise as independent scientists. Um, the nominate, and so those are things that the nomination letter can speak to. And so, and one of the things that we do look for is um, that the, the nomination should kind of speak to your ability to communicate your science to an interdisciplinary community of scholars. And this is a really big part about the Miller Fellows Program. So you will be in this cohort of about 10 fellows, and they are going to represent science across many, many different disciplines. And you need to be able to um, communicate. I mean, the beauty of this program is you is that you can communicate your science to this, this broad group of, uh, of scientists. I mean, that's one of the things that we're looking for in, in, the, in the Miller Fellows. Okay. So, so that's the nomination process. That's a letter that will um, uh, come, will be sent to our, our office. And then based on that nomination uh, process, and just to make sure you meet all of the, the, uh, the criteria, um, um, you will be asked to submit an application. So that application, there'll be a biographical, you'll have to give your biographical information. Um, you will write a research statement, which is one page long. Okay, which is harder than you might think. It's not very long, um, but and it has to be kind of accessible to the interdisciplinary panel. So when you write that research statement, you know, just I mean, I'll tell you right now, the executive committee who um, that one of the things is we review those applications were a uh, earth and planetary scientist, an astronomer, a neurobiologist and uh, someone who works in uh, you know, statistics and um, uh, computational biology. Right, so those are the people who are going to be reading your application. It's a very general background, um, and uh, and so that's just something to keep in mind when writing uh, the research statement. You'll add a, a, a CV and a publication list, and then um, you will also be asked to provide references. So four to six references are allowed, um, and one of these references must come from a Berkeley host, a potential Berkeley host. 
um, a, a, a Berkeley faculty who will kind of serve as your host. So you have to have contacted someone at Berkeley. You have to say, you know, will you host me? And this is where we can get into a lot of um, uh, details about that question. Um, Okay, let's see. Now the chat is good. So the chat has exploded. So I think I'm going to actually go ahead and um, introduce the two fellows because they also might be able to um, clarify some of these questions or answer some of these questions. So the first fellow is actually Michael Kim. And I've asked these guys to talk about sort of what the, introduced themselves, but then what they were thinking sort of at this stage of the Miller application process and how they went about making the decision and the process on um, applying. So, so Michael, take it away. Great, thanks Marla. Uh, so uh, as I said, I'm a third year fellow, started the program in 2020 after I defended my PhD. I was at Stanford University and I study theoretical computer science. So this is sort of the mathematical foundations and statistical foundations that underlie computer science. Um, and in particular, my a lot of my research focuses on this idea of responsible computing or thinking about questions of fairness in computing. So maybe those are new to most people. So I'll give a like 20 second overview of them on the next few slides. So the the I'm gonna go through just like a cartoon example of something that might happen and does happen in predictive systems. So the idea is to understand this idea of miscalibration and how that can lead to unfair discrimination. Okay, so calibration is a formal notion, but we won't talk about it formally here. It, intuitively, it asks that the predicted risk score, so if I'm trying to predict say rates of cancer, or rates of uh, lung disease. Um, I want my predicted risk score to track the actual risk score. So if we go to the next slide, we might see that uh, overall in this cartoon, the predictions look calibrated. As I increase the actual risk, the predicted risk increases as well. But if we look further on the next slide, we might notice that actually there are two subpopulations here. Um, the yellow one and the blue one. And across these two subpopulations, the predictions are not actually calibrated to one another. So uh, on the next slide, um, we can see that actually, or we, this has been noted that actually empirically, this type of thing happens in standard medical risk predictors across groups defined by sensitive attributes like race, okay? Um, so, Empirically, we observe that these predictions are miscalibrated. What's, what's the uh, upshot of that? Well, this miscalibration can lead to disparate treatment on the basis of group membership. Okay, so as we'll see here, when we draw a fixed threshold of the predicted risk score, in effect, what happens across these miscalibrated predictions is that you get two different group dependent thresholds on the actual risk score. So stated colloquially, in order to qualify for advanced care, in this case, in the studies that they showed, black patients had to be considerably sicker than their counterpart white patients. Okay, so this is the type of concern that, uh, that we look at in, in my research. And we say sort of, okay, we observe this, how do we go about reasoning about it in a sense that is formal and where we can give guarantees on the algorithms that we're developing and try to understand, be able to explain to people what the issues are and how to make progress on them, and how to improve these scenarios so that this type of thing doesn't occur. So that's really just a teaser of my research. Um, I'm happy to answer questions offline about that. So on, on the next slide, um, I'll just give some very high level uh, reflections on Miller so far, and I can speak to where I was um, at this point in the, in the process. So uh, the highlights of Miller for me are that it's an incredibly well-run organization. Um, Hillary and Brenda and the other staff members uh, do a really amazing job for making your life really easy as a fellow, which is huge and rare in uh, too many organizations. Um, so that is a huge plus. Um, I would say another huge plus, especially having started during the pandemic, 
was that Miller gave me an immediate community of other like-minded scholars, but from very different fields. So that was also just uh, an incredible benefit. And uh, sort of academically, you you get complete freedom to do whatever you want. Um, you know, I think even, you know, you have a host, you're in their group, but like really the point of the Miller Fellowship is to do independent research. Um, okay, so in terms of where I was at, um, honestly, if you're on this webinar right now, like you're worlds ahead of where I was uh, in terms of the application process. Um, I, I sort of only got my stuff together very last minute and uh, it, it, it worked out, but I think you're, you're already uh, way ahead of the curve. Um, the suggestions that I would have are to really try to find and identify uh, a Berkeley host who will be very committed to your Miller Fellowship, okay? And, and so this, I say this for two reasons. One, in the application process, you need a very strong letter of recommendation from your Berkeley host. That's, that's just a given. The other is that I think that the people who um, have the best time as Miller Fellows are people who um, are sort of constantly engaging with this uh, you know, expert faculty member and really bouncing ideas off of them as peers. Um, that's sort of the best possible scenario in the Miller Fellowship. And it has certainly been my experience, um, which is uh, uh, to say that it's been great. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize is uh, that, again, to reiterate what Marla said, the research statement is very broad. You want to be communicating to a broad scientific audience. One thing that we do in Miller for talks is that we do coaching sessions, okay? So these are where I might be giving a talk and I will present uh, about theoretical computer scientists or theoretical computer science to a bunch of biologists and astrophysicists and physicists, okay? Uh, who might not know anything about computer science, but still they should be able to get something out of my talk. Um, so I would recommend doing that kind of thing, passing your statement around to other friends and colleagues that you have in other fields. Um, yeah, I can pause there. All right, that's great, Michael. And um, and so I'm just gonna uh, um, interrupt just very briefly before we go on to Veronica, just to uh, address a couple of the questions before I forget about, um, and maybe Veronica, you can speak to this, about the nomination process and how well do you have to know a Berkeley professor? So usually the nomination is done by um, someone who knows you well, and that's usually your PhD thesis advisor and, and can speak to your abilities. Um, the uh, how well you have to know a Berkeley professor, and I think Veronica may speak to this, is really not that much. I don't think Michael did either. Like you will say, oh, there's, there might be this professor at Berkeley. It's someone I might consider doing a postdoc with. And then if you contact that professor and say you want to apply for the Miller program, they're going to be super excited to talk to you about that possibility, right? So you don't have to really know them any more than you would know people you're contacting about considering postdocs. So I just wanted to get that out there and now we'll move on to Veronica and then we can have a bigger discussion about this after that. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I already introduced myself and Marla introduced me. Thank you. So my name is Veronica. I'm also a third year fellow, just like Michael. Uh, I came from a bit further away. So I did all of my education so far in Europe. I'm originally from Croatia. This is where I got my master's degree. And then I went on to do a PhD, joined between two institutions, one in Scotland, that's University of St. Andrews. It's very pretty. Uh, and the, the other one in, in Dresden in Germany at the Max Planck Institute. And my field uh, is experimental condensed matter physics. And so some of the considerations I think are a little bit different for experimentalists, but I'll touch upon that in a moment. And uh, so I was, uh, when I was, you know, when I finished my PhD, I was at a similar stage that many of you are now, which was, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do in the next step. And of course that's different for every one of us, but I'll just tell you some things I was thinking about at the time in case that's helpful. Um, so on the next slide, I think I list uh, just a few thoughts I had then. So basically, uh, can, we, yeah. uh, can we go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So basically, the general, general 
theme of the thoughts I had at the time was that I wanted to do many things I didn't have the opportunity to do yet. And so one thing I wanted is to learn some new experimental techniques and in particular techniques which work well kind of as a complement to the ones I knew already. And in my PhD, I used to you know, travel to facilities around Europe mainly to do my experiments. Now I wanted to do something that's more in-house based. So now I spend a lot of time like tweaking mirrors in Berkeley. Um, Another big thing is that I wanted to practice conceiving and coming up with projects on my own. And that starts with writing the application that we talked about now. And the reason I wanted to do that is that I was kind of afraid of doing it. I thought that's quite challenging to come up with something independent at the time. And so the reason to bring this up now is that in case that you find the idea of writing this one page proposal intimidating, that's fine. I think most of us do because it's the first time that we've done something like that. Um, but there are actually plenty of resources that can help. And one is like Michael mentioned, talking to colleagues from different fields. Another is talking from more senior colleagues from your own field. That was very helpful for me. And yeah, it can work out. Um, and other things I was looking for is the ability to mentor students and also I wanted to be in a place where there was a large uh, presence of people in my field so I could collaborate with other groups and theorists and so on and so sort of uh, yeah um, and then another thing I wanted is to, to be to explore a different research environment and so having been in Europe so far I wanted to move to the US and really importantly for me, I also wanted to live in a place where I thought I could have fun outside of the lab and work is like that. I think we'll talk about that a bit more later. And so sort of by the time I looked at all of these considerations, there were maybe two different um, groups and places I could uh, I could imagine wanting to, be, to work at. And my top priority was the group in Berkeley that I work on, that I work in now. And uh, I started, you know, I got in touch with them. Um, yeah, so, so this is the choice of the lab in Berkeley's environment. And then the question is why choose a Miller Fellowship rather than some other funding source. And I think many reasons were already mentioned uh, and discussed, but I want to touch upon two of those. So one is this uh, uh, notion of academic freedom and resources that was mentioned. So what academic freedom means for people, I think depends a lot on the kind of research they do because it's different if all you need is your own computer versus if you need many people and very expensive equipment. But regardless of that, the, the financial sort of independence gives you much more freedom to choose your topics and to control your own time to decide what you want to do and what you don't. And about uh, the, the research fund, what's really important for me in particular is the ability to travel and collaborate. As, as an example, the picture up there, the, the top one is from, um, it's from a conference I was at last week. It's actually a conference center in Vietnam. It was a lot of fun. It was a great conference, met lots of people from my field. It was very expensive to get there. So really having this research fund enabled me to do it. And I appreciate it. And the other thing is, it's already been mentioned, is this community of fellows. Um, from outside of your field from you can get sort of a broader perspective of what science is about but the really important aspect of it is also to have a cohort of people who are at a similar stage in their lives and careers and with whom you can share experiences also make friends that's a picture from a dinner party in my apartment there's also my colleagues <laughs> um, and so i think i think that's something that uh yeah that postdocs often miss actually because there isn't a natural cohort as graduate students have and the Miller Fellowship provides that for us and it's great. So yeah, that's it. I've been to answer questions. Great. All right, that was great. So um, first of all, I want to say that all of the, uh, there were some weird text things on Michael's um, uh, slides that was my fault so i apologize michael for making your slides less than perfect <laughs> and then second that i think those are really great introductions um for what uh the miller program is like um i was should i go ahead you guys and just talk a little bit about berkeley like in case people don't know about berkeley so um okay i was just going to introduce berkeley so this is where berkeley is um on the planet this is where we are. This is um, this is the San Francisco Bay. Right here under San Francisco is the famous Golden Gate Bridge. I um, mean, Berkeley is sort of right across from the Golden Gate Bridge, located on what is referred to as the East Bay. All right, and it's a very beautiful part of the world, and a lot of us just really love living here. The Berkeley campus is quite spectacular. It's got this. I think it's neoclassical architecture, but someone can correct me on that if I'm wrong. It's nice architecture white stone whatever that is um and uh and it's just it's a it's a very um it is a campus that's filled with you know 
undergraduates and graduate students um, uh, and all sorts of excitement associated with that. Um, we, there is a big effort right now on the campus to establish a postdoctoral culture. And I think both Veronica and Michael spoke to that. You know, you guys are probably mostly PhD students right now, and PhD students tend to have these kinds of um, uh, uh, communities built into them. But postdocs will often say that you go to an institution, you're a postdoc in a lab, and it's really hard to find like your uh, a group of people who are in the same place where you are in your career. And so not so the Miller is great for that. And actually the campus has really established this scholar visiting scholar and postdoctoral affairs office. Um, our chancellor, uh, Chancellor Chris has made this a big priority. If you're interested, she has a lovely video that you can go to, to to hear what are the efforts in that. So there's an office devoted to sort of postdoctoral affairs. Whoops, sorry. Um, there's uh, also a postdoc association. So if you're trying to figure out, can I afford to live there? You know, what is it like? Uh, how do I find real estate? There is this, you know, a place to live. Uh, where do I, where do people shop for food? Is there daycare for my kids? Like there's this nice postdoctoral association that has lots of career development um, uh, uh, organizational events. They have social events. They have some, they have a lot of diversity and inclusion events, but it's also just a great, place I know for postdocs who have come to my lab that they can go and sort of talk to people about where do you live and how did you move there and how do you move your car across country and things like that. So, so there's a nice postdoctoral organization there. Um, there is also a very big effort on the campus right now to include, um, there's a deep commitment, I would say, to increasing um, uh, representation of underrepresented groups in, in STEM. And our Miller Fellows have actually um, engaged in a lot of these activities. They have also um, uh, initiated some of their own activities. For example, they go to a uh, local middle school and they contribute to the science curriculum. Some have worked in, you know, helping out in science fairs and such. But there's a lot, there's like, there's small sort of person efforts like that, and there's bigger efforts. And like I said, there's a lot of really fantastic programs on campus. And I really, if you're interested in this sort of um, uh, spending your time on working on this sort of stuff, I really recommend you go to this site here that describes those efforts. Um, okay, Berkeley, the city. So we have spectacular views and spectacular sunsets. This is this big clock tower is referred to as the Campanile. You can look up on the hill and see the Campanile, the Golden Gate Bridge in the background, sun setting in the west there. Um, we like to brag about our food. Um, it's funny, people can be very foodie and like to go to very high end places like a place called Chez Panisse where California cu cuisine was established. Um, the supermarkets are great. I personally love Top Dog in Cancun. These are like burrito places and hot dog places that have been here you know, forever. Um, and there's just a lot of really great food no matter how much you wanna spend on it. Um, it's something we're very proud of and, and downtown Berkeley is just packed with these restaurants. Um, there's all sorts of culture, there's theater, um, there's like big concerts you can go to, um, there's an art museum that's on campus, there's a, there's a community theater, I mean there's a, there's a theater in downtown Berkeley that has sort of, uh, where a lot of stuff um, is tried out before it goes to Broadway, and you know we're a college campus, we're in the NCAA, we're in the shrinking Pac-12 for those of you who are following this. I'm a big sports fan of all these events. This is the main thing that I go to are the basketball and football games on campus. So, um, and then I'll just end by saying we have quick access to amazing recreation. So just east of the Berkeley campus, just a couple miles up the hill is a beautiful park that's called Tilden Park where a lot of people go for hiking and biking and dog walking. Um, we're three hours away from outstanding skiing in Lake Tahoe, um, the Pacific Ocean uh, is, only 30, 40 minutes away, the water's really cold. So just like, it's not the kind of beach, ex California beach experience that you might anticipate, but um, it's, uh, it's usually quite spectacular. Okay, so that is really, oh, and we have great weather. So, <laughs> which, uh, and we can show you these slides later, but you know, it's very moderate throughout. We have sunshine most of the time of, during the year. Okay, so if you have more questions, you can contact Hillary, you can contact me, and I think you can contact any of the other uh, people who are on this call. So, so that's all I had for my slides. We can now open it up for um, more discussion. 
if you want to raise your hand, if you want to just put something in the chat, uh, that would be great. So um, any, so I now I have now, since I've been yapping for the last 10 minutes, I've now lost track of the chat. So let me know if there's something that can be addressed or if Veronica or Michael, you want to answer some of these questions, take it away. Okay, let's see. I'll go from. Uh, yeah, I, I I would respond to the how early you would recommend contacting hosts. I would okay. contact your host as 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 soon as uh, as soon as possible. I think getting in touch with them or having, you know, either directly or through your advisor is a great idea. Because uh, you can start building that conversation and going back and forth to really get a a sense of what you would do during the Miller and getting a strong nomination letter. Yeah, and you can have more than one host. Those things are kind of just make it more complicated at this point. Like right now, it's probably easier to just reach out to one or two faculty that seem appropriate. I remember when I asked Michael about this, you know, he said he looked up some research. He said, oh, this person looks good. He went back to his PhD advisor and said, do you think this is a good person for me to contact about a postdoc and his PhD advisor said, sure, just email him. Um, and so I think really, I mean, everyone, I can speak from a faculty perspective, loves to, no one is, gets tired of those emails. I want to do a postdoc in your lab. And then, and then if it's a, uh, and I want to apply for Miller Fellow, I would be super excited. Okay, there was a question about um, uh, inclusion. Um, we do have, um, uh, we have had black fellows, we have had Latinx fellows. Um, I know one, uh, uh, let's see, we've had black fellows um, are uh, from the US, also from different countries. Um, uh, and we have uh, indigenous, I'm not, Sure, it depends on, do you guys know if uh, um, uh, about whether uh, we've had uh, indigenous people on the fellow, in the fellows group that I'm not sure about. Um, and then, but we have on in the visiting Miller professor program. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, is there a limit to how many Miller? No, um, actually, is there a limit, Hillary? <laughs> Miller fellows they can host there there is no limit um but uh, Marla do you want to speak to how the executive committee looks at hosts in the process yeah so so when we make our assessment right after the applications have come in you know one of the things that we're looking to do is to not have you know three Miller fellows in in one area or for you know there's only 10 in a cohort and so chances are we're not going to have four in astronomy, right? We're going to try to spread it across departments and not only spread it across departments, but, you know, likely to. And so it's less likely that we would when we're picking our cohort and taking into account all of that, that we would have two people, you know, one host supporting two Miller fellows. I don't think that's ever happened. That said, we have definitely had more. Um, we have had one host, you know, sponsoring in the application more than one Miller Fellow. So that is um, has happened. Um, um, and yes, if a if a current host is currently if a current host already has a fellow, it does not hurt them in the future. So there's no uh, refractory period after which they've had a fellow that they're not allowed to have another fellow. Oh, in the staff, uh, we have one uh, Miller. Uh, we have one black person, I, but I'll let Hillary speak to that. Yes, we do have underrepresented and people of color on our staff of four. <laughs> um, people leave before. Uh, so if someone else is three years fixed or people definitely leave before. Um, I have to say, uh, one of the things that surprises me, so the executive director, my position rotates, and so I've only done it for a short time. And the time since the time I've been here, it's like shocking to me how many people, how many Miller fellows go on the faculty positions from here. And some of those happen very quickly, right? And so they can get faculty positions even before their three years is up. 
So that's very discipline dependent. I'll tell you, that's rarely a biologist. So in biology, postdocs are longer. I would say maybe Michael and your field are shorter, right? So people can get faculty positions just a couple of years out of their PhD. Um, so that's a really kind of discipline specific thing. So many of the Miller fellows will leave before their three years, not many, but uh, you know, it's it, it, there's always some who leave just a couple of years. Yeah, I think our year, we're going into our third year and maybe there's six or seven out of 10 left. Is that right? Yeah. So, and mo most people going on to really fantastic, exciting opportunities. Also in academia and outside of academia. So it's not that yes. everybody goes to faculty positions, but yes. many people chose to. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Chase, you have a question? Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for all the info. Um, I have a question for the fellows though, and it's kind of a hard one because when you are successful in your application, it's hard to know what you did right um, and what made your application competitive. But I was wondering if you did have a sense, like talking with other fellows, um, things that they did and things that maybe they heard of other people who did that weren't so effective. Like, should you focus on the research statement or is there a big emphasis on the publications? Um, I don't know. What was your strategy for your application, I guess? I think actually that's maybe a question for Marla who reads this <laughs> <laughs> educations and sees both the ones that are successful and the ones that aren't. I that's think the, the advice that I have definitely received, well, one thing is we already mentioned is to write it in a way that's readable to, to, the, uh, to people from various fields, but it also has to be readable. It has to also sound interesting to people from your fields. It's not just readability outside, but you know, your department will be reading that uh, that application. Well, I think that's right, right? So they, they have to also see, you know, it shouldn't be an overview of your field. It should be clear what's new in what you're proposing to do. And another advice I've also received is just to sort of um, uh, emphasize in some way why your, why, you know, you're able to do the research that you're proposing to do. That's not completely out of the blue or something like that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, she that... did it. yeah, I mean, I think Michael's introduction is a great example of that. I think everyone on this call understood that question. Right. And then, you know, he probably then does something more sophisticated than, you know, like that that would have come up. But he started with a question that was compelling. Right. And I think that that's that anyone can understand, you know, and it could be a big question in our field. So those of us not in Michael's field, for all we know, there's seven million people working on that question or there's three people working on that question. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's a compelling question. Right. So he can start there. That's kind of paragraph one. And then if he wants to sort of overview to uh, explain to us what are the approaches, how do you address this? And then where does he fit in to that? I think it's it's great, right? Because then we all, and then maybe I won't understand when reading the application, the paragraph that is the detailed one about the method that he's using, but either his letter writers or, some, or someone on our committee will be able to speak to that. But just like that compelling kind of first question, or just like, you know, giving our a context on where in the field your question fits is really helpful. And then I'd say the other thing, and that also speaks to one of our requirements really is that you can communicate your science to a broad group of scientists, right? So, so you know, if you're a neurobiologist and you know I'm on the committee, do not write your application to me, right? Write your application to the earth and planetary scientists. And I will still appreciate, you know, a good, and I can read your papers and I can, you know, I have other ways of assessing your contribute, the details of it, but it's good to really be able to communicate that. So I hope that kind of answers. Oh, I'm sorry. The last thing I was going to say that um, you're wanting to be part of this community is a good thing to mention, right? So, um, or, uh, you know, that that I am excited to be part of a group of interdisciplinary scientists because it'll help my research. It'll help, you know, whatever is your perspective. Um, so I think that that's another good thing to explain why why you want to be in this interdisciplinary program. I would jump in with one thing that was that, you know, was helpful for me in just developing my statement was actually going back and forth with my host. So, you know, my 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 host, she is um, an expert in computer science broadly um, and has done really amazing work, but was only somewhat familiar with my research. So 
um, communicating and going back and forth and sort of thinking about both sharing my statement, drafts of my statement with her, and then, um, you know, providing material that she could use in a letter, like really sort of kickstarted the whole thing and really got us, I think, in sync and excited about it. So I think it's like that type of thing will also help get your letter writers excited about the prospect of you um, being a Miller fellow and working with you. Um, somebody asked about the, oh, go ahead, Chase, you gotta. Oh, I was just gonna say, thanks so much for all the response. Um, somebody asked about, it is true, I, did, I left this out in the nomination process, you are ranked by your by the host department first. So um, yeah, so there is a, so there is a, um, and that is a really important part. First of all, it helps us, you know, have some perspective, right? It helps the people making the final committee. We don't, we don't, you know, those aren't necessarily set in stone, but they, um, they help, they will influence our um, opinions and the, and your, the faculty here who would be your host knows that. So they will take that into account in their nomination letter. And I think what happens within each department is really different. Um, so if you have questions about like, you know, you think you'll be in, considered in chemistry, some people are cross, some people will be considered in chemistry and molecular and cell biology. Clearly I have my own bias here. Um, so, so people can be considered by two departments and you'll be ranked by two departments in that way. I think, Michael, you're in two departments, right? Or are you just in one? No, I'm just, uh, I am in one department, uh, but my host is the director of various institutes. So I have some sort of affiliation there, but only one department. Okay, engineering. Someone asked about engineering applicants. Okay, this is one I'd rather, it's really, I think for a while, engineering was never part of the Miller fellow because engineering was applied, right? And, but, but engineering, many areas, we have many material scientists, we have people who are really doing basic research in engineering departments. And so we kind of do that on a case by case basis. If you're not sure, please email me, you know, but if you're going to make, I don't know, an improved tire, <laughs> car tire, I don't know why I just came up with that, but you're gonna make a, an improved car tire. Um, and there's like no basic kind of scientific research that goes into that, then um, probably not. But if you're, you know, but if, but if you need to do some new chemistry with the goal of making a new tire that's fundamental chemical question, synthesis question, then maybe. So that's a really vague answer to a difficult question. I think I, I've, I've chatting with other people who are on these committees. I think I've heard that, you know, the thing that will keep you in the running is emphasizing the basicness of your research. Right. Why is your research fundamental and what what foundational questions are you trying to get at? Um, you know, computer science is a rather applied field and many computer scientists are engineers, but more and more like computer scientists are included when your um, when your research is about fundamental issues and when you can highlight how your research is uh, basic research in the field. And actually, if I can speak to that for a moment, I think that this is actually a very interesting um, moment, which is different from any other funding applications in my field, for example, which is, as I said, it's experimental uh, condensed matter physics. And there are many funding agencies kind of want you to talk about applications. And so you might receive advice to talk about applications, although your research is fundamentally uh, fundamental. And so that's actually not good advice in case of a Miller application, although it might be for other for other types of funding. Great point. All right. So I I think I may have lost it on the chat. Is there something that maybe? Uh, yeah, Marla, you talked a little bit about this already, but I've gotten several questions about the research research statement. Mm. What should people include? How much detail should it be? Should it be every project a person wants to do while they're here? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, it's like it's really hard to have a single formula that works for everyone. Um, so make it uh, so, for example, how much do you include about what you did for your PhD? And um, well, if it's really going to inform 
you know, what you're going to do for your postdoc, then you might include more of it. Um, if you're really switching gears, you know, you might not talk about it so much. It's like, it's a really hard, so I think, you know, start, uh, and I, I did answer this, I, I think a little bit before, you know, you're not only communicating the question, but your ability to uh, um, uh, uh, communicate that question to a broad group of scientists. So really starting with a, um, uh, um, you know, what, what maybe, you know, what is the big question you're interested in? But, you know, let's say your PhD was in something totally different. My PhD actually was in physics. It was actually in experimental condensed matter physics. And I switched to being a neurobiologist. Um, when I, and when I was a Miller Fellow, that's how that, that's when I made the switch. And so I didn't talk that much about my PhD. And rather I talked about, you know, how I could use optical methods to study neurobiology or something like that. So I talked just a little bit about what I did for my PhD. And then just what was the question going forward? You don't have to make it like a, I have three aims in year one, I'm gonna do this, in year two, I'm gonna do that, in year three, I'm gonna do that. There's not enough space for that. Um, and um, so I think that those are important things. I also want to encourage people to also um, include sort of your, biographical data, if that's important for you, and that informs your research, right? So if you're, uh, um, have had some life experiences, oh, I'm, I really should have thought of these examples before, and you grew up in a, in a community that had poor water quality, and you wanted to come up with a new way of doing osmosis to clean the water, you know, so <laughs> I don't know, that was a really bad example, but, you know, that's hopefully, like, if don't, uh, please include um, your biographical information if that will, that sort of informs your work. So for example, we had a Miller fellow, um, Tim this year who came from a, uh, uh, now I'm gonna forget what, uh, in, in uh, a small village in Africa that actually did have a, uh, had, a uh, had a big problem with providing um, uh, energy, right? So that there, that there, the the power was going out all the time, and so he became very motivated for um, studying uh, better batteries. And so, you know, he started by talking about that, and and sort of the path he's gone on uh, for making better batteries. And this was a great case where he made the case that basic science discoveries have to be understood before we can make better batteries, right? It's not just like, how do I package one to make it smaller or something, but you know, we need new chemistry to understand how to make better batteries. And so that was a very compelling case, which worked for him, but may not work for someone else who had a different reason for um, wanting to do research in batteries. So, that, so that's all fine, right? There's like not one formula for everyone. So, so having lots of people read it is key, right? Have lots of people read it. Um, as many people from a, you know, uh, with different science backgrounds will really uh, help. I would jump into, I think the, you know, I think everything that Marla said is uh, great advice. And uh, regarding like sort of listing, trying to be exhaustive versus telling a story about one thing that you're gonna do, I would much, rather see a story, right? You're going to have a separate section where you have a CV and you can list your many accolades. Um, and the point of the research statement is to give a focused example of the type of question and the type of the way that you think. It's your one opportunity to, to say something that isn't on your resume, right? And so um, formulating that into a story and making it as compelling as possible even if it's not exhaustive is uh, to your benefit. Marla, can you address this question in the chat? Is the proposed research is the proposed research preferred to be a continuation of PhD research or is it preferred to propose a new area? How does the executive committee feel about that? I don't I think we're neutral. You know, if you just have to make the case what works for you, right? If you if you you know, worked on something that you loved and you want to take it to the next step, you want to make it interdisciplinary. Uh, you know, uh, so I had a, I a um, long time ago sponsored a Miller fellow um, who had gotten his PhD in, uh, um, I think, computer science and wanted to apply that to neurobiological questions. And so, you know, he, uh, you know, talk to me about how we could do that and he could learn to do some experiments. And that was what we wrote his um, 
proposal on, right? So he, so that wasn't a continuation, but we have had many Miller Fellows that have done same area, you know, but, uh, um, and it's just like the next step but they wanna bring a new dimension into the question. This is particularly true for people in astronomy, right? So in astronomy, most people continue. I mean, I've learned so much about the field of astronomy. I don't know if any of you are astronomers, but as graduate students, people lead projects, you know, like they say, point the telescope there and that, you know, and so they've written proposals, they've had tremendous independence. And so a lot of them will continue to work on the same questions as um, as Miller fellows. So it's different in the field of astronomy than it is for biology and it's for physics than it is for computer science. So those are all different. And then it's different for each individual, whether you want to keep doing your PhD work. So that's, it's fine. It's not a strike against you if you want to do that. And um, we, you know, like to say that, no, so this thing about number of papers, it's so different for different fields. It's so different for different fields that we certainly don't count papers. As far as I can tell, chemists, Chrissy, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, they publish like 14 papers a year. It's like crazy how they do it. And biologists, uh, you know, will, will publish one paper every four or five years, right? So it's just really different in different fields. And so we certainly don't count papers. Um, there is a big, we definitely take into account, in, uh, particularly in some fields like in math, um, things are on preprint servers. And so, you know, whether it's, so we can, we don't really use, you know, we use other things to assess rather than the journal that they're in to the impact of the work. So, so it's really like, don't worry about how long or short your, your publication list is. If I may add to that, as I said, applications are also evaluated by departments, and I think different departments might have different culture about how their ranking is influenced by the publication list. So that's maybe also something to discuss with your potential host. Mm -hmm. What's there? Excellent, excellent point. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think we're just about out of time. You know where to find us. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see applications from all of you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye.